anything reference to that. And what let's see, we, this is closed, being closed captioned, which means that we have a captioner that is, um, as we speak, putting everything down that we uh, have to say and um, taking all the verbal and making it into a readable document. So, Michelle, I think you may want to stop the recorder and, and get rid of the echo and then start it again. Yeah. Sorry about that. Recording. Okay. All right. I would like to uh, now introduce our speaker. Jackie Hood is the director of the College Open Book Textbook Collaborative, which is a group of 16 institutions that drive awareness and adoptions of open textbooks. This is one of the many large programs that Jackie has managed, and others um, uh, were in new product development. Technical support of telecommunications and computer systems. Jackie has also published four books. She has appeared in Who's Who of American Women and won a McGraw Hill Fellowship in Engineering Journalism. She received her master's in engineering from Carleton University. I don't know what I'm most impressed by is that she and her husband rode their bicycles 4,500 miles across the USA and Canada. So take it away, Jackie, and we are delighted that you're here to present something that is just amazing, so timely. Thank you very much, Michelle. I'm actually delighted to be able to give something back to CCC Confer. Michelle and her staff, um, and ET, Donna, uh, their, their manager, Blaine, and the wonderful Confer captioners have just been so great. Um, I used to teach customer service and project management, use CCC Confer a lot. So I'm, I'm so happy to do this. And I'm also so happy to see the audience. And what I'd like to do, as, as, as Michelle mentioned, as many of you as possible, please type your names and your affiliations, your roles into the chat so we have a record. And now what I'd like to do is find out, I'm going to ask a couple of questions about roles. And Don, uh, Michelle told you how to raise your hand in the upper left. So I would like if you are a faculty member, a regular, a professor, an instructor, or an adjunct faculty member, please raise your hand so we'll get a count on faculty members. Okay, we've got up to 19 so far, 20 faculty members. Um, raise your hand with the hand with the green icon. We've got a few people check marking as well. That's fine too. Okay, so it's more than 20, probably more than 25 of you are faculty members. That's really, really great. We like dealing with other roles in the colleges, but it's the faculty members that ultimately have to deal with educational resources. So I'm going to put those hands down now, and I'm going to try one more category that we often get, and that's librarians. Is anyone a librarian? We have one, two. These may be left over from faculty, a couple of librarians. Okay, other people that we often get in workshops are bookstore managers, some, some positive, some having difficulties with the idea of free and open educational resources. Another job category we often get are instructional designers, instructional technologists, uh, and people are saying that your hand is not showing up. I, I did shut the hands down, so we would have two different categories. Uh, we get a lot of administrators. Uh, we get um, we got people from that are deans and people that are provosts and so on. So, Chris, uh, do you have a question? Or are you still raising your hand for? Well, I'm going to put the hand down, and then if if Chris has a question, if he or she could uh, type that in the chat, that would be good. Una Daly is here. She's the associate director of College Open Textbooks, and Sharon Fitzpatrick is our marketeer, one of our marketeers on College Open Textbooks. They will be answering questions in the chat. Um, and warning me if I'm not paying enough attention to the chat questions. So again, delighted to have all, all of you here. I will be talking about open textbooks, and I'm going to start with why open textbooks and other kinds of open educational resources exist. Um, as you probably know, the average community college student spends upwards of $1,000 a year on textbooks. 
And here in California where our tuition is very inexpensive compared to some other states, that's often more than they pay in tuition and fees. We're seeing about $600 a year in tuition and fees and $900 for textbooks. Um, it's a smaller percentage in other states where units are maybe $150 rather than $17 for a unit. And, and while you say, well, you know, in the end they're paying less than people in Mississippi, the thing is that the textbook cost is a surprise. The student and his or her parents have, um, have planned for the tuition and fees, and they didn't know what it was going to be like to, to deal with textbooks. And we see students dealing with this in many ways, not taking as many classes, trying to get by without the textbook. Uh, I dropped a class uh, because it was Spanish class because the textbook was $175. Um, so we, we really, really need to solve this problem for students. Um, the teacher, however, the instructor, all of you instructors, all 25 of you plus, don't have a lot of time. So you, you don't necessarily want to go spend a lot of time looking for resources, essentially building your own textbook. And it's so convenient when the representative from Pearson or Cengage or Wiley or McGraw-Hill befriends you and shows you all the wonderful things that the publishers can do for you. Um, but on the other hand, even if they do their best job, you've got a 35 chapter book and you're only going to use a few chapters out of it, the students are going to have to pay a lot of money for it and they're going to complain even more. Hey, I had to buy this expensive textbook and you only used seven chapters of it. Uh, that's with a textbook, which I did after the first time I taught my class. Then I've got my students in the learning management system jumping all over the web and they don't like that either. <laughs> so uh, it really leaves the instructor in a dilemma. The other obvious dilemma is none of us want to use copyrighted material. It's one thing to pass around a copy of the Wall Street Journal in a live class, but as we teach on learning management systems, that sort of use of copyrighted material is uh, illegal. There are some exceptions, but in general you can't take copyrighted material and put it onto your website or or any kind of a public website. So now you not only have to be a textbook author, but also an attorney. And it gets so complicated uh, that this gentleman probably doesn't look as unhappy as some of us are when we're trying to create a class. However, there is a solution that's happening and it's growing, and that's open textbooks. So what is an open textbook? An open textbook, the sort of legal definition of an open textbook is it's a copyrighted textbook, but the author has chosen to release some of the rights. It's no longer copyright all rights reserved, but now copyrighted some rights reserved. And in particular, the textbook um, author and the other people who go into creating a textbook, and it's not just an author, uh, have said, okay, uh, it's all right to use this material to reuse it. For example, when I was advertising my class, I really couldn't legitimately make photocopies of copyrighted material for the marketing session when I was pushing my class. Uh, with open resources and open textbooks, I can do that legally. Um, and Creative Commons is the mechanism that's used most for some rights reserved. It's also possible for an author um, uh, or a creator of a photograph or an, a book or anything to put it in the public domain. And then it's literally wide open. Um, you don't even have to say who wrote it or who created it. Uh, on the other hand, it probably would be a bit limiting for your career if you claimed that you had invented Max, Maxwell's equations or um, that you had written Shakespeare's sonnets. So while it may be legal, it's probably not uh, ethical to uh, to go without attribution. The Creative Commons uh, licenses all almost all require attribution. And you'll notice down here at the bottom of my slides, my slides are Creative Commons by, which means if you use these slides, and you're more than welcome to do that, uh, just please um, say that they came from College Open Textbooks. I'd much appreciate that. So I will get rid of that. So the other thing that um, we have is a more informal definition of open textbooks, and that is that they are often modifiable by the instructor. So it is possible to change them, to move the chapters around, to get rid of the chapters you don't want, to make the chapters and the content more adapt 
it's, it is adaptable, so you can adapt it to your students and what they need and want, uh, up level it a bit, down level it a little bit. Um, so there's lots of choices uh, when you have open textbooks in terms of making it more tailored to your to your students. In addition, the books are much lower in cost to the students. And of course, they, free is often used, and it's, it's not a good word. Um, because if you say this textbook is free on a computer when you're on the internet, well, the student needs to have a computer and have internet access, and not just you know, sharing that, a dial-up uh, with five other people in the family, but high-speed access. So free is relative. For some students, purchasing a bound textbook may be cheaper than getting a computer and internet access. Um, and in some colleges, if you have a face-to-face -face class, you're not allowed to tell your students they have to get a computer. Um, and so telling them the textbook is available to them online uh, may not be allowed in your college. In addition, the students can often print the open textbooks using the printer on their computers. Um, and they may have to pay a, f a small unlock fee to be able to print. And then usually, or at least sometimes, bound copies are available at fairly low prices. I think the most expensive one I've seen was $60. Most are in the $10, $20, $30 range for the bound copy. So let me see. I see somebody's defining free and free beer and free. <laughs> we'll, uh, I'll stay away from definitions of free. Um, so this is, these are sort of working definitions of open textbooks. Now, um, what we have is, oh, I think I got my slides in the wrong order. This was supposed to be my index slide. So this is my topics, which, um, which we had talked about, which we had put on the advertisements for this webcast. So I, I am talking about textbooks, and then I'll be talking about um, other sources of modifiable textbooks. So in addition to um, knowing what open textbooks are, you need to find out how to find them. And what you don't want to do is go into a commercial or into one of the search engines like Bing or Yahoo or Google and type in, uh, say for example, chemistry. Because you will get over a million hits. And it will be very difficult to tell if those, which of those are open licensed. So you can go to the Creative Commons site itself. It has a lot of open materials there, uh, including not only textbooks, but uh, music and, and so on. But I recommend, if you're looking for textbooks, that you consider these five sites. Um, and there are others, but these are some that I would specifically like to mention. And because this is a California audience, I'd like to particularly point out Merlot. Now, um, Michelle told you how to um, do a check mark. If you are familiar with Merlot, please click on the check mark in the upper left. It's the Multimedia Educational Resources for Learning and Online Teaching, and it is part of the Cal State system. Um, it's a worldwide resource, but it's administered here in our state. And we have, oh gee, at least 20 some people, a couple who said no, they're not familiar with it. So by all means, check it out. Um, the, first, the first screen on Merlot is a little busy. I would recommend you go immediately to the advanced search button in the upper right, and then it'll, you'll get a much nicer interface. And you'll see that it's a very rich search, uh, a very easy to uh, specify that you're looking for textbooks as opposed to other resources. And when you do that, you'll get close to 1,000 textbooks show up on Merlot. They have lots of other kinds of resources, smaller resources and so on, but from textbooks they have about a thousand. Now our site, which is College Open Textbooks, we have a smaller number. We have about 550 open textbooks. And the reason is because College Open Textbooks is actually the community college open textbooks. And we're focused on textbooks that are appropriate to the first two years of college. Uh, Merlot has also K-12 materials and um, upper division and graduate school materials and textbooks as well. So we don't include things like diseases of the brain because that's not going to be a class that's taught in community college. We're much more into algebra, English composition, uh, first, first and second year college classes. 
our colleagues at the Student PERS, which is an advocacy group for students, they also list a number of open textbooks on their site, a good place to check out. Uh, University System of Georgia has a, a wonderful list, and all of these on this page are lists. They're not places where textbooks are stored or other resources. They're lists. Folk Semantic is a search engine designed for open materials. So those are the five that I'm recommending today. There are others. And again, these are lists. They don't actually store the textbooks. Here are some of the places that actually store the textbooks. Rice University Connections um, is a wonderful repository of very open materials, almost no restrictions on those materials. Orange Grove is a, a project of the um, Florida Distance Learning Consortium and the University Press of Florida. Very high quality textbooks and other materials, including uh, academic papers and so on. The Global Text Project stores um, open textbooks, I think, almost entirely in PDF form. Open Learn is a project in the UK focused on open courseware, some of which is, is textbooks. Curriki and CK12 are high school sites. Um, not so much, you don't see the K through 5 so much as you do um, sort of middle school and high school. But a lot of, a lot of both Curriki's and CK12 textbooks are appropriate to community college, especially the remedial classes. So definitely check those out. They're both, Curriki's very techy, and CK12 is more um, user friendly for people who don't have a, a Unix background. And then more than half of the textbooks that we point to on our site are on individual websites. And so you won't find them by going to these repositories. These repositories don't tend to tell you about other repositories. Orange Grove is a bit of an exception. They tell you about materials on other sites. So I do recommend the list for a place to get a more general view of what's out there. OK, I'm going to pause for a few minutes and see. Una or Sharon, are there questions I should be addressing right now? Um, Jackie, there's been um, some questions about accessibility, and I know you're going to cover that um, okay. later, so I think we'll let you um, do that. Um, and okay. we've had some good questions about what's open, and um, we've had great responses from, from folks. I see someone wanting a, a textbook on nutrition. And that's where if you want something a little bit more specialized like that, um, then do go to the sites that don't specialize in community college. I mean, you may be using nutrition in a community college, but it, it, it would um, perhaps be a subject that's a little bit more specialized. Um, and then you would want to look at Georgia Share and so on. So I am going to talk about accessibility in a second. I promise that you would want to, um, that you would be seeing world class open textbooks. Well, I regret to say they are not all world class. No, they are not all up to publisher standards. However, we're doing what we can to help you find um, materials that are the best of the best, if you will. And so the first way we're doing that, and other people are doing that, including Merlot, is to do peer reviews of the open textbooks. Merlot has a wonderful system. Um, they have a three-person board for each topic. And so the two reviewers each independently review the materials. And Merlot has a wonderful training uh, for, for reviewers. And then they submit their review to the editor, who then combines the two reviews and adjudicates if there's a difference between the two reviews and then publishes it. Their reviews are anonymous. Um, you, I mean, you can probably find out who the, who the reviewers are, but you won't see um, the name of the reviewer. We have a different approach in College Open Textbooks. Our manager, um, Judy Baker, Dr. Judy Baker, came up with 11 criteria for judging open textbooks. And we hire our reviewers, and they review the textbook each chapter one at a time on the 11 criteria, and create a, create a big spreadsheet, uh, do a summary. And then our reviews manager, Bill Buxton, takes that and takes a subset of it, a very small subset, a summary of the entire ratings and a summary of the comments, and puts it up on our website. We have um, reviewed more, peer reviewed more than 100 te open textbooks. 
and our goal before the grant is over is 138. We're getting close. Uh, if you're interested in reviewing, let us know. There are other reviews available. Uh, Assayer is one. A lot of them tend to be sort of thumbs up, thumbs down kinds of reviews rather than the detail level that that Merlot and uh, College Open Textbooks provides. So any questions about peer reviews? Okay. Now, when I had brought up the question of, of um, accessibility, we don't ask our peer reviewers to do accessibility reviews. Instead, we've hired specialists to do that. So in our first uh, year, actually it was about our third year, but in 2009, we hired Nobility to do 40 reviews of open textbooks for accessibility. And this is the U.S. Law Section 1508 and also the International Standard WCAG 2.0. This year we've hired Virtual Ability, and um, that company has reviewed 60 open textbooks. Not this, not, there's no overlap between those two, I believe. So we have a total of 100. We have the 40 posted on our website. And very soon we will be uh, posting um, the 60 as well in graphical form. And then if you need more detail on either of those or on the peer reviews, by all means contact us and we will um, allow you, get you that um, get you that information. So I see Priya is asking how to be an open a peer reviewer and you can do that. Yes, um, Una's posted our reviewer's uh, email address so you can contact Bill and uh, he'll be happy to <laughs> share with you the very difficult spreadsheet and, and, and he has a, he now has a, a training class for reviewers and he will talk to you about, about that process and how you select a book and so on. So at this point, uh, the usual question we get around this time is, okay, how do we get these textbooks to be $20, 30 $40 when a comparable textbook from a commercial publisher is going to be well over $100? Um, and it's a complex process. Um, one of the things that we notice that it's pretty easy or at least fairly easy to get people to write textbooks and other open resources if they get their name on it and it helps their career. And the textbook publishers have discovered that authors are willing to work for royalties, which means if the book doesn't sell, the author never gets paid. Um, on the other hand, the other people that make the textbooks, the technologists, the illustrators, the copy editors, uh, and let's say in music, you have to have a PhD in music to be a copy editor for a music textbook uh, because you've got to get all those measures and beats and everything correctly. Um, so how do you get the rest of the textbook built when, when the people that are involved are not going to get royalties and they're not going to get a whole lot of prestige from writing a textbook? Well, there's a number of ways to do it. One is um, grant funded. So we do have some wonderful philanthropic uh, foundations that have been funding the establishment and the development of open textbooks. Another way is, um, is to do it as work for hire. A department in a college decides that there's no good textbook out there. So for example, College of the Redwoods, the math department has written two open textbooks and it's just work for hire. They just they go to work and they write textbook on part of their time that they're not working on other things. So uh, we do get work for hire. Some of the technology companies pay for uh, their staff to write technology textbooks and so on. So I, I, there's an excellent network management textbook at Cisco Corporation. So we get, we get grant funded, we get work for hire, and then what a lot of people think open textbooks is crowdsourced, and there is some of that. There's the wiki books, the wikiversity, and so on, and you get crowdsourced open textbooks. And, and we hope and encourage that not only writers get involved in that and instructors, but also illustrators, photographers, and so on, so that we get a rich textbook. Well, when we're trying to um, promote adoptions of open textbooks, we do reach some resistance. One is quality. That's obviously very, very important to instructors. Another is will the textbook be around? Is it, as in Eric Frank's terminology, is it evergreen? Not only green, but will it be around forever? Um, another uh, objection we get is, hey, the, 
the, the big publishers, they give me all these ancillaries. They give me PowerPoint slides. They give me um, test banks, homework programs, and so on. Where's that for open textbooks? And while we are striving to get those things, it's difficult. And so what we are just delighted to announce today is that the for pro oh dear, I can't get my slide to the right one. The for profit publishers have joined the parade. And I like to think that open textbook movement has in some ways acted as a gadfly to the uh, commercial textbook publishing industry, much like credit unions do this for banks. Uh, the banks haven't gone away because they're credit unions, but they do have to be more responsive to their customers and, and lower their prices and provide better service. And we are seeing some publishers now jumping on the bandwagon for open textbooks. And the small publishers are leading the way. Um, and we are very, very delighted to work with Flat World Knowledge and with textbook media. Flat World Knowledge is entirely an open textbook publisher, does not publish any other textbooks. They are all under Creative Commons. I've been around for about four years, venture capital funded startup. Uh, it was part of our group um, in 2008-2009 and is rejoining our group this, this month. Um, not only have they produced an outstanding collection of open textbooks with good ancillaries and have achieved 15, more than 1,500 adoptions, college instructors and some, uh, some high school instructors, uh, but they also have just been fantastic for publicity about our movement. Um, they've got a wonderful PR firm and of course being, being uh, venture funded gets them into the business press and so on. So we're really delighted that Flower World Knowledge exists. And recently we've been, we're actually for some time we've been working with textbook media. Textbook media has had a very nice business model for many years that is not open but very low cost to the students. And they started out with advertising supported textbooks and they have some other um, approaches to business models. Last spring we started working with textbook media asking them to open license some of their textbooks. And they have agreed to do that starting with six textbooks and they will also be opening more later. And their authors tend to be people that really care about students. Uh, they, their, their standard business model are books that are 10, 15, 20 dollars rather than more than 100. But these open textbooks will um, be better mm -hmm. than that in that they will be modifiable. I mean the books already exist. It's just a matter of changing the license and that's going to happen in the next few weeks. Um, there are three excellent accounting books, um, a managerial and a financial accounting books that you're, oh, I'm staring at them on my bookstore shelf right now, oh, roughly 500 pages. And then the principles of accounting or accounting principles it's called is uh, almost 1,000 pages. Uh, really excellent accounting books, and a wonderful political science American government book a couple of English composition books, and this one called Grammar, etc. is actually really is a comp book, not just a grammar book, and then they have another writing book as well. And what I really like about textbook media's books is they have an outstanding set of ancillaries. Not so much the English comp, but the other four books um, have homework programs, the accounting books have financial forms included as ancillaries, ancillaries for both students and teachers, study guides for students, um, teachers' guides, and so on. So these two small and we hope growing publishers have been a really, really big plus to us. However, they're not, a, they're not in the top ten when it comes to textbook publishers. So we need to get into those larger publishers to really make a difference. So I am pleased to say that Macmillan, which is surely a name you've heard of, started a division last spring called Dynamic Books. And Dynamic Books takes one of the most important elements of open textbooks, which is modifiability by the instructor, and carries it into commercial textbooks. And furthermore, Macmillan Dynamic Books is not just putting Macmillan's books on this new Dynamic Books pub, uh, platform, but also has opened it up to all the other publishers as well. So you will see eventually McGraw-Hill and Cengage and Pearson books 
um, and Wiley Books on the Dynamic Books platform, not just Macmillan Books. The teachers um, can adopt a textbook on, on this platform, on this software platform, and modify it and produce their own version of it. In addition, and even better, Macmillan came out and met with us. Clancy Marshall, the, the general manager of the Dynamic Books Group, came out and met with us and agreed to put, to start with, 25 open textbooks on the platform. And our reviews manager, Bill Buxton, went through our open textbooks, chose 25 that are of high quality and that were in a, a correct format to work on the, on the platform and recommended those to, open, to Dynamic Books and worked with the technologists at Dynamic Books to put these open textbooks on. And when you buy, when your students buy a commercial textbook on the, on the Dynamic Books platform, they will pay roughly 50% of what it would cost them to buy the book in a standard fashion. But with the open textbooks, all they pay is a $25 fee to use the platform for that term, and it's for all the textbooks that they're using that term. So it's not just per book, but it's for the entire term. Um, and they get to download a PDF of the book and keep it forever. So this makes a, this is a big difference from the rentals of um, or the subscriptions of, of eBooks in that the book does not disappear at the end of the term. And it's the teacher's version of the book that the student is getting. So um, does not have to look at chapters that are inappropriate, sees the chapters in the order in which the teacher wants them to be, and so on. And the teacher can add materials to the textbook as well. So very nice. It's also published in EPUB format, which makes it work on many platforms, many mobile platforms, and also makes it uh, quite nice for accessibility and that, that EPUB fits, um, moves over into DAISY fairly easily and from there into text-to-speech speech readers. And bound copies are available of the textbook and the students can keep both the bound copy and the, the PDF forever. Okay, so um, someone's asking if dynamic books are for college or high school. I think that dynamic books is focusing on the the college market right now, but there's no reason why it shouldn't also address. And there's a lot of overlap between um, advanced placement high school and, and community college. Um, and so someone's asking about um, about platforms, uh, learning management systems. Uh, that's Patty. Um, yes, many uh, open textbooks can be fed into your um, your learning management system. And generally, we do recommend that you move the textbook, that you capture a version of it and keep it, because versioning is a big, a big issue with um, any kind of ebook. You don't want the students who are using it on the web to see a different version than those who ordered a bound copy or who, who downloaded a PDF. So you want to capture the book, uh, a specific version uh, for that term. Okay, so I see a few more. Una, anything you think I need to really address right now? Um, I think you've been covering it. Um, yeah, thanks, Jackie. Did someone ask about Flat World? We talked about that. We did talk okay. about that. Um, okay. Scott said something about dynamic would be good for AP courses. I'm assuming he meant dynamic textbooks or dynamic right. books. Dynamic <laughs> books, right. Yeah. Um, and I see someone saying that Moodle is open and free. Well, um, you know, free is it's just like textbooks. Uh, Moodle is open and free, but it still has to be hosted somewhere. So either you have to have servers and host it yourself, or you have to find a, a hosting company. Um, and so, again, free is always one of these interesting questions. Now we have a new announcement from one of the big four publishers, and that's McGraw-Hill Higher Education. So the big four are Pearson, Cengage, McGraw-Hill, and Wiley. Um, Macmillan is in the second tier. And a couple of weeks ago at the Educause conference, um, McGraw-Hill Higher Education announced modifiable textbooks. They're not open licensed, but they are modifiable, and that's one of the key elements that we want and that, that, that Open has brought us is modifiability. Now like most publishers, McGraw-Hill has had a, a course pack idea where an instructor can 
pull together materials from a lot of sources, and the publisher goes off and clears the copyrights and creates a semi-custom textbook or semi-custom courseware, if you will. But the actual textbook itself was not modifiable. So like the dynamic books model, the McGraw-Hill Higher Education Create model will now allow the students, the teachers, to modify the textbooks at the chapter level. We'd all like it to be at a lower level, like paragraph or sentence, but uh, chapter level is what a lot of instructors really want, is the ability to leave out chapters, to put chapters in the correct order for the way they teach the class. And furthermore, it's a drag and drop interface, so it's not difficult to modify the, the textbook. And the teacher can instantly get an ebook uh, to see what it looks like. And if, if that was a mistake, they just go back and change it and get another ebook, and then eventually can get the bound textbooks as well for their students. So this is a big step in moving into that $10 billion plus market where we will have modifiability um, of textbooks from the commercial publishers. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. I do expect that the other three of the big four will jump on the bandwagon. And we know from some conversations with Pearson at Educause that they are looking at it. Um, we, the publishers are well aware of what happened to the newspapers with Craigslist and other types of news services and the search engines and AOL News and CNN News on the web and other things. The newspapers really went through a very, very hard time and still are going through a very hard time. Um, there is still advertising on uh, Internet-based um, media, but it does not pay anywhere near as well as advertising in newspapers did. And so many newspapers have folded. And the publishers realize that the Internet is going to have an, an impact on them, just as it did not only on the newspapers, but on the music industry and so on. So they are all looking at uh, digital. They are all looking at rentals. And I think they are also starting to understand that we really need modifiability. And the students really need choices um, from using readers to using the computer, I mean electronic readers, using the computer, um, and choosing to either print a textbook or, to, or order a bound copy. So I do believe we will see announcements in the next year or two from these major publishers. And if you have a Pearson rep or a Wiley rep or a Cengage rep that you deal with, please tell them the students need more options. Um, yes, Jackie, we had a question um, from um, SK, and they are asking, does the McGraw-Hill textbook, can it be open in a text-to-speech reader? I, I don't know what the format is for McGraw Hill. Yes, and I don't I don't either. Um, so sorry, I can't really answer that. Again, the publishers know about accessibility law and accessibility desire, and um, I, I think they probably, if they're not already there, they're probably moving toward EPUB format um, to move it into um, uh, text to speech. But certainly. Well, we can look at that. An Acrobat reader, you know, obviously for PDF formats, which are less accessible in some respects, but um, PDF has a text to speech built into the Acrobat reader. So, okay, I see the SK question, and we have um, some others who are contributing answers here. Really appreciate that. Here, San Sanford Forte is here from. Flower World Knowledge and Sanford was actually, before he went to Flower World Knowledge, he was the marketing person on our project. So glad to have him here. Okay, well, I didn't take um, all my time, but I will summarize now. Uh, this photo is open licensed by Dr. Judy Baker, and we certainly feel that open textbooks rock and that they're, they're a major, major step in improving education, improving access to education. Uh, making life easier for instructors so they can focus more on um, on the content. So I encourage you oh, to visit these websites. Um, I've sent the list of the URLs to Michelle, and she will publish them. She'll she'll do a follow up. Most of them you could just simply uh, use a search engine 
And um, since this is a California audience, I encourage you to, to uh, visit the OER Center for California, which was authorized by the legislature a year ago. Dr. Baker runs that. Um, it's a very rich site. I think we have about 600 members on that site right now. Flat World Knowledge, I talked about textbook media. Go ahead and, and visit the textbook media site. You will see their standard business model, which is very low priced, copyright all rights reserved textbooks with a rich set of ancillaries. Um, the open textbooks, the six that I mentioned, we will be publishing very soon, uh, perhaps on the Global Text Project, maybe even on our own website. Um, so just stay in touch uh, with us and um, we'll keep you informed as to where to find the uh, the Creative Commons versions of those textbooks. Um, go ahead. Jackie, um, Phil had a question about um, whether the open textbooks are in the uh, standard learning module format, the SCORM IMS packages that um, are common in a learning management system. Well, I I will say that it's probably I've heard of SCORM and that's about it. <laughs> okay, but it's all across the board. The individual author who writes an open textbook and puts it up on his or her website may not have a clue how to do that, and so it's not going to be some of the more sophisticated repositories will. So it it really how it, there is no one rule. Open textbooks vary from uh, the level of sophistication and technology. Any, any others, Una? Um, let's see. Um, David wants. Um, let's see. David wants to put up the links to all those sites as well as the slides. Um, okay, and we will do that. David will put those. I mentioned earlier that um, the slides will be up on our College Open Textbooks Ming.com site this afternoon, and he would like the links as well. And I think we can pull those out. So absolutely. Right. Sure. You can do that. Um, and Priya has asked, do we pre predominantly support community colleges? And yes, we do. Our our project is the Community College uh, Consortium for or the Community College Open Textbook Collaborative. So we are focused on community colleges. Uh, but some of the others that I've mentioned here, fellow knowledge is also focused on higher education. But I did um, cite Curriki and CK12 that are focused on um, on the K-12 market. One of our, our flagship book is Collaborative Statistics. It was accepted in the California program for high schools as well as used extensively in college. I know at least one adopter who uses it in fourth year of college. So, it's a, um, so there's a lot of overlap between the various markets. And we did have, um, this came up earlier and Eric posted it again and it was about bookstores and um, his concern about how bookstores, you know, that bookstores are not adversely affected by that. I, did you want to come in that one that's, more time? That's, yeah, that's a very good question and I really didn't go into detail. Mark Nelson with the National Association of Co College Stores and Don Newman, I believe, with the California Association of College Stores, have been working with us a lot. And I gave a presentation for the California Association. We've had bookstore managers come to many of our meetings. Uh, they're like the publishers, and they know that they can't continue with the business model that was invented over 100 years ago. So they're anxious and eager to look at new ways to serve their students. And, and we have different kinds of bookstores. We have bookstores that are owned by the colleges and that provide scholarships and assistance to students with their profits. We have insourced uh, bookstores uh, from Borders and, and Follett and so on, uh, or Barnes & Noble, I believe. And they have different uh, objectives in mind, but they all know they have to get into digital. And we're working with them because not only the textbooks don't necessarily provide really huge margins, but they sit at the back of the store and they cause a lot of foot traffic, which causes sweatshirts and computers to get sold at higher margins. So we're looking at things like a wonderful machine called the Espresso Book Binding Machine that can produce a 300 book page book in about three minutes, um, so that this the bookstores can purchase one of these machines between $75,000 and $150,000 and put it in their bookstore, replace some of the shelves that were used for physical books, and students will be able to come in and order on the spot and get bound books, um, print on demand. That's one alternative. 
Uh, the Dynamic Books platform, is, for example, is available on a, on a, I think it's a flash drive or something that's equivalent to a flash drive. Because some students on scholarships um, or financial aid need to get their books from the bookstore. So they'll be able to go into the bookstore, buy one of these little devices for $25. The bookstore can get some margin. I think they can even mark it up. Um, so there's a lot of ways that bookstores can be helped um, and, and can work with us, and, and many of them are working with us. So uh, we had a few questions about um, audio books and um, also um, open textbooks for the iPad. Um, okay, I, be I'm, I believe in yesterday's presentation by Flat World Knowledge, they mentioned audio books available. Uh, when you put something onto a platform, like the Kindle, for example, you get automatically get audio as an alternative. Um, so as we put things onto various platforms, um, then we pick up the audio. But not all, not all yeah. um, textbooks have audio. And I just wanted, well, I wanted to mention. Um, the text-to-speech capability that's in, in um, Acrobat Reader. Um, it's also in some of the EPUB readers also have text-to-speech. So you're going to get that for free in, in some cases. Right. Okay. Um, so just going on down the list here, our community is collegeopentextbooks.ning.com. And we would welcome you to join. You can see all the pages without joining, but if you join, then you can blog and join in the conversation. And we have several groups on that name, including authors, adopters, accessibility, librarians, and so on. Um, when you go to that site to find this event, uh, it will go into past events by the end of today. So be sure to look into past events and not try to find it in events. And that's where we'll put the slides and the links and so on. And I believe Michelle will also send out at least the links to you. And feel free to contact me and I will put you in contact with Una, with Sharon, with Bill, uh, with other people on our project. Okay, any other we still have a few minutes left, a couple minutes left, and then I'll turn it back to Michelle. Okay, let's see. All right, well, thank you all for attending. And Michelle, again, thank you for inviting me and our project to your to your webinar series. Oh, thank you very much. We really, uh, I think, gosh, with the attendance and all the great questions and comments that you got, we really uh, learned a lot. And we certainly, yes, clapping there is definitely, we, I want to thank Jackie and Una and Sharon for um, a wonderful presentation. We will be sending out an email uh, with the links. Um, Jackie's going to send me some additional um, information and then we'll send the link to the archive and you certainly can share that with your friends. So let's see, I want to click over here. Thank you very much. Any feedback is welcomed and if you have any topics that you might be interested in, we certainly would love to uh, hear from you. And if you need to be trained or any information on CONFER, please give us a call. So once again, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, everybody coming and certainly the, uh, the presenters today. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.